Welcome quickly to our next speaker. It's a Richard Freeman from the Department of Politics. Um, he's going to talk to us about the story of the possible Scott. I want to begin with a story, a story of the possible Scott. It's a story that I discovered um, some time ago, 10 or more years ago. I was interested, I was working on a, a project looking at policy learning and particularly the ways in which different countries picked up ideas from each other in respect of public health. In the course of that project, I discovered something that possible Scott and I immediately into possible Scott, what's that? Isn't that interesting? And the story is this. I hope you might be able to see the at least look at the sheet I've got you. I want to start in the middle because it's where I started. And it, um, the story begins, I discovered, not long after the last referendum, the devolution referendum of 97, um, following which, when Scotland was clearly going to get increased parliamentary autonomy, responsibility specifically for health, policy. The question became, so what are we going to do with it? And a, a group of intellectuals, public health activists, public health professionals, policy makers, got together to figure out, to dream the dream in respect to public health, which they called the possible scope. It connected, as I say here, new thinking about health with new thinking about government. Both of them broadly inspired by systems thinking, governance in respect of quality and uh, systems thinking in respect of public health. I discovered, and I began to, I learned that it had transatlantic roots and transatlantic consequences. I began to try to follow them up. One of the authors clearly had read a book called, with an equally distinctive title, going up the way, 94, Why Are Some People Healthy and Others Not? And that in turn was a rewrite of an, of an academic paper by Evans and Stoddart, which in turn was a theorization of a new perspective on the health of Canadians, the famous Lalonde Report, which actually defined a whole generation of work in public health. It's the origin of the idea of health promotion. That, of course, came out of Department of Health, National Health and Welfare in Canada, and again, a particularly vibrant, vigorous group of um, free-thinking, free free-loading, and so where we get the bureaucrats, free-thinking, uh, free-thinkers in a small, long-range health planning branch, one of whom had read Tom McEwan's famous historical appraisal of the medical task, which was the book that established Interest, I think, innovatively, certainly importantly for the time, the sense that the improved health and longevity of populations has not to do with the provision of health care, but obviously with improved nutrition, lifestyle, economic development, and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, back to 2000, 2002, um, the possible Scott spawned a lot of subsidiary has their own connotations, but a lot of offshoot documents applying this kind of new thinking in Scotland uh, to new fields such as um, mental health. At more or less the same time, some of the authors of Possible Scott found themselves in Verona for WHO meeting, a meeting um, looking at, at the possible involvement, essentially the possible involvement of the private sector in public health 
policy making. That meeting was attended by the chair of Highland Health Board, who picked up the idea of the possible Scott, took it home, and produced it, reproduced it, applied it um, in Inverness and beyond. Steve Platt, one of the authors of the possible Scott, bumped into a guy called Mehmet Oz, who was a cardiac surgeon from New York, who was hugely taken with the idea. He connected with Margaret Hanna, another author of the possible Scott, wrote a, in a series of transatlantic phone calls a further application called the possible human, which was a man approach, and took it to then to a meeting of the World Economic Forum. Um, you know, not insignificant for, for this kind of idea to be um, distributed or put about. And Oz, being Turkish himself, Turkish origin, also then wrote the possible Turk. So that's, that's the story, such as it is. It's obviously, it's an artifice in the sense that I've chosen particular roots and connections, um, rather than others. And I guess what I got interested in was, in order for the idea to be kind of bodied forth, it's bodied forth in, the, in and on paper, certain kinds of connections had to have been made. And I was interested in what is it that kind of pushes the document, pushes the idea around the world, and how could I understand that through the materiality of the document? I've got just three slides, and I want to tell you, by way of background, how I think we might think about documents in public policy. First, is note that policy is made in documents. Mm -hmm. Government, as one of my respondents said, fabulous phrase, government is a text-based medium. Mm -hmm. Without reading and writing, there is no government, at least no action at a distance on which government depends. We tend to think, we, I mean scholars in public policy, have tended to think, I think, in rather limited ways about what a document is and how it works and what it does. Documents are commonly taken simply as darts, as vehicles of whatever messages, message it is that they carry. Discourse approaches tend to think rather of documents as somehow expressive of episteme, as ways of thinking, conditions of possibility, you know that kind of language. I, I guess public policy may be, as ever, slightly behind the curve. Um, I found it useful to think about the document as an artifact, as something made, importantly, in groups. Docu a document is something made by people in order to do work, and it was that kind of way of thinking about it I was interested in. The thing about policy documents is that they're often written they're often unsigned, but are written collectively. That's to say they're products of people bouncing ideas around in meetings and somebody doing the first draft and then it getting edited and knocked back and so on. Similarly, they're read in groups. That's to say it's meeting, you know, a document produced in, in um, Hollywood or St. Andrew's house will prompt a meeting in Inverness to say, what we're going to do about this, this latest government statement. So there's a collective authorship and a collective readership in policy documents that we need to take account of. I think, and this is sort of me piecing together an idea over, um, <laughs> you over know, time and over different bits of work, that actually we can think of the whole of public policy broadly, policy making, as a succession of documents and meetings. There's something about the document that requires it to be talked about, usually in groups, as I said. And there's something about talking of that kind that needs somehow to be recorded and fixed in a document. So you get what I call the sprung rhythm. That's Joe and Hopkins. It's the sprung rhythm of policy making, that an idea bounces from document to meeting to document to meeting. Because what is talked needs to be written down, and what's written down needs to be talked. The story suggests, is an expression, I guess, of um, the kinds of things I've described. The story suggests that documents exist in chains, 
Now, I already think the chain is unduly linear as a metaphor. There is a kind of line through the paper I, I distributed, but it's because I drew it that way. The, you know, ordin some accurate picture of the connections from one document to another and all the other myriad documents any given piece of, any given text might be connected to would be simply impossible to describe. I've tried to pursue this, the, the question I mentioned earlier, which is to ask how, how is connection made from one document to another? Because that seems to be intrinsic to the dissemination of the idea. I read a lot of documents in order to try to tell this story, but I also talked to a lot of people who've written those documents. Um, I used, don't get scared, I used <laughs> the idea of the intertext. It comes from seminal names in uh, European, in continental philosophy, essentially. Um, whom I don't know, don't pretend to know. I have taken somewhat derivatively the idea of the paratext from Jeanette. It's a, the idea then, if we're to capture not, the whole point of this is that <coughs> there isn't one document but a set of documents. And, it's, and meaning is derived from the set. We read one document only in the light of others we have read and others that we need to write. Hence the intertext. My question is how to figure out how one document connects with another. And my conceptual hook is the intertext, specifically the paratext. Jeanette speaks of the peritext, that's to say the front, the front cover, the back cover, the inside cover, references, um, so on and so forth, as well as the epitext, reviews and other writings that might be produced in response to a text. Obviously this idea has worked out in respect of literature, if you do it in public policy, what counts as a, you know, a review of a book might be the rearticulation of a policy statement in uh, the organisational plan or job description or whatever it might be. I want to add to the sense of paratext kind of peripheral activity, the peripheral processing of the document in meetings and conferences because I think they were clearly important. Actually intrinsic and essential to my story. I looked particularly, there's a, there's a kind of, there's a very baggy paper that, that tells the story and some of the ways I've tried to think about it. I have a story and some stuff, but not yet a paper, so there's a kind of casual plea for help here. I looked at, I looked closely at the title, the title is quite distinctive, it doesn't come across on the poor image I was able to show. Um, titles mattered, clearly. Why are some people healthy and others not? The idea of the possible Scott, which drew me as it drew others. Um, I looked at a lot of references and thinking of referencing as a system of. We call on references, we adduce references to buttress our own argument, but that at the same time reproduces the authority of the reference. There's a reciprocal validation, I think Nigel Gilbert refers to it. I traced kind of manually some of the references, some of the, the, the specific references to one document from others. Um, this is Arno Simons. Have a look at his poster. He can do this stuff properly. He's got it, um, that's to say, by doing kind of uh, bibliometric analysis of how, one, how, how documents kind of cascade, or how, yeah, how documents are connected in cascades. Um, this bit of the peripheral processing I've started to describe as a kind of structured contingency. People bump into each other in meetings. Somebody comes across a book and thinks, oh, we can use that. It's not entirely random. It's not entirely by chance. Of course, these meetings are all public health meetings. They're all conducted in English. They're all, they're all sorts of structural factors which account for why some people bump into each other, why some texts bump into each other. Finally, 
all readers in my story tend to become authors. Well, authors are authors by dint of reading. They are always translating, appropriating one document written in one context for one audience for one purpose, or indeed multiple audiences in multiple purposes, and repurposing it um, for their own more local use. So I can talk about translation. This passage, this transatlantic passage of the idea of the possible Scot, is a passage across countries, across languages, across domains, from health to government, and so on. It's a translation between registers, the more academic one of the, the journal article and the academic monograph, administrative papers such as ministerial statements, as well as the more kind of advocacy-based lobbying initiatives of think tanks. There's also, this is from actor network theory, an idea of translation between interests. People get enrolled as authors. Steve Platt talked to Leonard Morris and somehow enrolled him in the project, excited him. Made him think that his interests might be the same as those expressed in the possible scope. There's also, we can think about individual enrollment, but think also about organizational enrollment. These, the organizations, um, the World Economic Forum, the WHO meeting, they invite people for, as organizational representatives. The Scottish Council Foundation is backed by all of these organizations. We have members on its, on its advisory board, and the, as the logos testify. The document, as to say, gathers up individuals and interests and sets them forth. Finally, um, where does this leave us thinking about the document? I still love Michel Carnot's rather impenetrable think, thought of uh, description of the document as a network whose description it creates. There's something incredibly elusive and elusive about that, but I think it describes what, what was going on with the possible Scott. Um, Bruno Latour was obviously someone who's thought kind of deeply and creatively about the way um, the material artifact of the document works and his his famous phrase of the, immu of the immutable mobile, you take a form, a bureaucratic form, and you can put it through the world and it's standardized. It's the same form, whether you complete it um, in Inverness or in Edinburgh. The thing about you know, the policy statement is not, okay, so this document can go around the world, but it, I don't think it helps to think of it as the immutable mobile. It's more a kind of temporary stabilization kind of local fixing, a local and necessarily unstable fixing, because it's only going to prompt further discussion and further application. Lastly, and my, I have a, there's something of a, a conceit about the story that I haven't properly developed, which is to say that the story itself, the document itself, the possible Scott, is about systems thinking. And I have a sense that the process by which that systems thinking was carried out was itself a system, a system of documents. And I'm interested in the extent to which we might think about these networks or chains of documents more properly and more creatively as systems. Thanks, Richard. Uh, questions for Richard? Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, mentioned before as a lot of the uh, documents as a conduit and uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, rhythm that it brings with, uh, with it. And I wonder whether you have uh, looked at anything in, uh, in rhetoric and particularly in some rhetorical figures like the ductus, uh, which, ductus, uh, or ductus, which is the Latin uh, from which uh, conduit comes from. Um, which is a, a, me a mechanism through which you basically engage uh, an audience and construct beliefs. Um, and uh, an important part of that rhetorical figure is also the rhythm. Uh, you have to do certain things in certain uh, moments, in certain spaces, in order for constructing beliefs and engage uh, an audience. I just wonder whether you, you have looked at these kind of things. No, but I'm intrigued. <laughs> yeah. um, 
fascinating stuff. I, I found myself uh, struck by the fact that the focus on the text seems to partly come out of the fact that the audience, or, sorry, the, the authorship is so, so general, right? Yeah. And as you said, the authors are also the readers, or the authors are the readers of the cycle. And it's more a comment, but you know, I'm sort of put in mind of Benedict Anderson's idea of uh, print capitalism in the American community. It's a, because part of, a lot of what this seems to be about is, is the way the community uses these texts to do a work of constituting itself through the use of them as much as through the content. I mean, is that, is that? No, that's brilliant. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly the right kind of allusion. Yeah, that makes good sense. It's interesting that the first the document at the top of the page, um, the New Perspective on Health of Canadians, was actually written. Um, the lead civil servant responsible for it said so actually it was one of the most elite and exclusive documents um, he had been involved in because it was just his departmental team that sat there and produced it. it. It's still important to me that it was a team. It was people sitting around the table bouncing ideas at each other. But they, w they didn't engage in any wider public consultation. But nevertheless, that document took up, was taken up by WHO by the kind of early 1980s, it was a sort of foundational text. So that is, and it, it's kind of behind the whole occupational project of health promotion. Really. So there is absolutely, a, a, beyond its initial drafting, it's kind of enormous imagined community with the health project. Yeah. Right. Can, um, we don't have lots of time, but we will have a general discussion afterwards, so remember your questions and, and we'll take them up in the general discussion. Let's thank Richard again. Thank